2007. We're at the Sheraton Waikiki Hotel in Honolulu, Hawaii, and we are here today to interview Chief Judge John Rowe in a brief video oral history, which is to supplement a longer, more complete audio oral history. I'm Paul G. Rosenblatt, and I'm here on behalf of the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Society. Aloha, John. Aloha. As I mentioned, uh, your oral history has not yet been taken, so this will be uh, a briefer uh, review of your history as uh, a lawyer and judge. And my first question, John, would be how is it that you decided to become a lawyer? PG, I, uh, it, it didn't have any, any genesis as far as my family is concerned because neither of my parents had graduated from high school and I was the first one in my family to graduate from college. Uh, but just following current events and, uh, and uh, frankly, uh, Robert Kennedy was Attorney General at the time uh, when I was in college and he was an attorney and uh, I was struck by his idealism and that really was one of the factors that motivated me to think about going to law school. So he was a, both a role model and an influence on your becoming a lawyer. Yes, when I was 20 years old. And when did you uh, graduate from law school? I graduated uh, in 1972 from the University of Arizona College of Law. Tell us a bit about your uh, earliest law practice. Where, where did that take place? I couldn't keep a job for quite a while. I started off as a uh, bailiff law clerk for a superior court judge, Joe Jacobson, whom you probably knew. And uh, uh, I, I worked uh, for him and sat in on every court proceeding, as was his desire, and all the jury trials. So I had a chance to see a lot of lawyers. I did that for six months. I was a city prosecutor for five months waiting for an opening in the Pima County Attorney's Office. And then I was in the Pima County Attorney's Office for seven years uh, before becoming an AUSA for another seven years. So a lot, of, a lot of career changes in the first 15 years. So you saw progression in the types of cases that you prosecuted? Yes. I started off as in city court with drunk drivings and shopliftings and, uh, and my first job with the county attorney's office was at juvenile court and that was only because Ajo was not open. They used to send the newest lawyers to Ajo. Dennis DeConcini was the Pima County attorney at the time, but we already had a lawyer in Ajo. So they sent me to juvenile, and then I worked my way to downtown to justice court with drunk drivings and shopliftings there, and then eventually into a felony caseload, and then sex crimes caseload, and uh, major crimes, homicides, and so on. Do you have any specific memorable cases that you uh, prosecuted? Yes, and neither of them were successful. I had a month-long trial with Bob Hirsch back in late 1975 and 1976. Uh, it was an insanity defense, and Bob Hirsch, of course, is one of the top uh, criminal defense lawyers, and, and his specialty was insanity. He had a trilogy of not guilty by reason of insanity verdicts, and I was the middle, n not guilty by reason of insanity in the trilogy. All three of us who lost cases to him went on to the state bench afterwards, so we said he was sort of a career builder, builder. for us. Yes. 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 And uh, another case that I had involved the prosecution of Christopher Dean, who was a South Tucson police officer. I prosecuted him for second degree murder when he shot and killed someone uh, in uh, 1977 uh, on the, over the 4th of July weekend. Uh, and, and that was an acquittal too. So when then did you make a transition to the bench? In 1987, I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, I uh, learned about a vacancy that was created by a mutual friend of both of ours, Judge Ben Birdsall, who had uh, been diagnosed with cancer. And I decided to apply for his seat on the Arizona Court of Appeals, Division Two, And... Uh, I had, although I had been a trial lawyer for uh, most of the time in the U.S. Attorney's Office, when I was in the office, if you tried the case, you also 
argued the case on appeal. So I had close to 30 jury trials when I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I ended up writing 24 briefs and arguing 18 times at the Ninth Circuit. And I thought that appellate practice would be, uh, would be interesting as far as uh, sitting as a judge. And, and Ben Birdsall was really a role model of mine. I, when I was in law school for one summer, I had the opportunity to work as his intern. And he is, I still have his picture in my chambers. Uh, he, of course, he died 20 years ago. Oh, uh, but he was a great around. judge. Yes, a wonderful man. And I served with him on the Superior Court in the state did. of Arizona for many, many years. But you didn't practice before him uh, in Superior Court, or did I you? I did. I tried a number of cases, or I, I litigated a number of cases in front of him when he was on the Pima County Superior Court. And about the time that he went on the Court of Appeals is the time that I uh, went to the U.S. Attorney's Office. So I, I never argued a case on appeal to him, but I tried a number of cases, and including a very high-profile case involving a woman who was kidnapped uh, from her home and murdered in uh, somewhere between Tucson and Tijuana. They found her body in Tijuana. The, uh, the uh, expert on the firearms identification was from the Charles Manson trial. He was with the Los Angeles Police Department. And uh, it was just a an, an, an really unique collection of circumstantial uh, evidence that we were able to piece together and it was a very high high pressure trial because uh, it was a very very serious and moving case and the defendant had a long record uh, and Judge Birdsall was the uh, was the trial judge on that case and I tried a number of other cases too but I particularly remember his demeanor during that and nothing he was just unflappable and always patient and calm with the lawyers and I thought I would like to be a judge like that if I ever get a chance to be. So what was it like being an appellate judge? It was very removed. Sometimes I would go days without anyone calling me unless Maureen, my wife, called me. Uh, and I used to volunteer for all this other assignments. I would uh, offer to, uh, to be the duty judge to take applications for uh, uh, special uh, interlocutory uh, appeals, uh, orders that needed to be issued and different things just so I could see members of the bar and other people because it was largely reading briefs and, uh, and uh, of course there weren't even that many oral arguments. We would hear arguments one day a week and the rest of the time we were reading briefs and writing orders and opinions. How long did you serve as the Arizona Court of Appeals judge? Almost five years. And tell us how you became a United States District Judge. PG, I would like to say that I became a district judge by just picking up the phone and answering a call from the senator inviting me to be a district judge. But it wasn't that simple, as nothing seems to be in, uh, in my life. Uh, I learned that Judge Fred Marquez was taking senior status, and so a vacancy was going to be created in the Tucson Division. In, uh, at the end of 19, 1989, I think, is when I heard about that. And then in 1990, uh, Senator John McCain, who was the one who was going to select the, uh, the federal judge or make the recommendations to President George H.W. Bush at the time, decided to create a merit selection committee. Uh, and so he created a blue ribbon committee of former Mayor Lou Murphy and Sandy Froman uh, from uh, Snell and Wilmer and uh, uh, Joel Valdez, the former city manager, and a number of other people. I think there were 12 people on the committee. They interviewed applicants, uh, and there were more than two dozen, over a two and a half day period and sent three names to Senator McCain. And then Senator McCain interviewed the three of us and sent my name to uh, the uh, to the president. Do you remember much about the confirmation process? It was very uneventful. It was one month, though, after uh, Justice Clarence Thomas's uh, uh, hearings. So maybe the Senate subcommittee was uh, exhausted? Uh. <laughs> that was my hope at the time. You know, most of the time they're uneventful, especially for the district judges, and mine was uneventful. Senator Simon from Illinois and Senator Strom Thurmond from, from uh, uh, South Carolina were the two 
representatives of the parties who were there, and the rest were all aides. Uh, but Senator DeConcini came over and introduced me, uh, and of course Senator McCain was there as well. Dennis uh, sat with me at the same time, and I uh, looked around and I said, Dennis, where is everyone? He says, you knucklehead, don't you understand? If anyone's here, you're in trouble. I'm sure that uh, <laughs> that was similar to your experience. Yes. They, well, they were, they were reading. Uh, Senator McCain was reading all the reasons why he had nominated me, and Senator DeConcini was next to me, and he says, even if it isn't true, isn't it wonderful to have somebody say these nice things about you? But, Said Senator, absolutely. But, but he was a great. He was, as I said, he was a county attorney when I was hired in the Pima County Attorney's Office, and he was always very supportive of different things I wanted to do, and I, I'm very appreciative of him. Did uh, the senator uh, ask you a question, Strom Thurmond? Yes. yes. What were those questions? Do you remember? I, I don't remember. They had a they had a briefing with the Justice Department the day before, and they gave us an idea of some of the questions. I think. One of them was, do you think that federal judges should run the run, should run the state prisons? Do you think that federal judges should run uh, the universities? Do you, you know, questions along those lines. And of course, you're kind of walking a tightrope because you have Senator Simon on the one hand and Senator uh, Thurman on the other, and you and you want to answer, of course, candidly and truthfully, but uh, you don't want to stray off point where you cause yourself problems. You mentioned Ben Birchsell as being a judicial role model. Did you have others? Uh, yes. I, I remembered, of course, a number of the ones from that you would also know from the Superior Court. Judge Marianne Ritchie was on the Superior Court before she went on the District Court. And I tried a number of cases before her, and I thought she was a terrific judge. And Judge Alice Truman, of course, was on the Pima County Superior Court. And at one point they, in Tucson, they were talking about having one county attorney, a deputy county attorney, appointed to each judge. And she asked me if I would be willing to be the, if, she, if I would mind if she asked me. And of course, I couldn't imagine anything too much better than getting to try all my cases to Judge Truman. Uh, and of course, the Royalston twins, Robert and, and Richard, were uh, gentlemen and, and really uh, uh, very civil and very, very good trial judges, I thought. And on our district court, uh, I, uh, I very much enjoyed the opportunity of trying some cases before Judge Marcus and Judge Bill Browning, who, uh, of course, is on senior status now and has serious medical issues. But he was a great trial judge. Do you remember your first day on the federal bench? Yes, I do. Uh, in, I, as I recall, one of the things that uh, you, nothing happens until you make it happen, and that was uh, a little bit of a different experience for me. I had, I had a chance before going on the federal bench to sit as a trial judge for four months. I switched places with Jim Carruth, who was on the Superior Court, and Jim sat as a Court of Appeals judge on the State Court, and I sat as a trial judge. Uh, and it convinced me all the more that I really belonged in the courtroom and, and as a, a rec closer to trials than I was as an appellate uh, judge. So uh, I had that experience. So it wasn't like the first time that I had actually presided over, over any cases. And then Lloyd also had, had arranged for me to go sit in Pinal County a few times, even before I switched with Jim Carruth. So that Lloyd Fernandez did that. So that he says, you can make all your mistakes. You can start the jury trial without the jury in the box and then remember it and bring them in. And nobody in Tucson will ever even hear about it. So I had a little bit of boot camp uh, before I, I went on. But, uh, but I remember the first time and I remember the courtroom that they assigned to me when I went on the district court, which was a courtroom that I had spent seven of the worst weeks of my life in with Judge Bilby. Uh, on a big organized crime drug task force case, and he declared a mistrial the morning the case was to go to the jury after a seven-week trial and hundreds of of, uh, you know, of exhibits and many, many witnesses and wiretaps and so on. And I thought it was ironic that that was the courtroom that they gave me to sit in since I'd spent so many bad days in there. But uh, And that was not Judge Browning's courtroom. That was... That was Judge. It, it used to be Judge Bilby's. It used to be Judge Bilby's courtroom, and then he moved across the street, and it was in the 
in the ground floor, which is now the Walsh Building, where bankruptcy is located, only it was on the ground floor where the post office used to be in Tucson. That was my first uh, federal court courtroom that I, uh, and that's where I had tried that case in front of Judge Bilby. Do you have, uh, could you tell us some uh, of your memorable uh, federal cases that you've presided over? Well, of course, in Tucson, an awful lot of what we do is criminal, uh, is uh, in being a border court, and it wasn't to the it wasn't to the same extent when I started as now, where we have five or six hundred sentencings per judge per year in Tucson. Uh, when I started, we it w wasn't anything like that pace. But among the cases that I had uh, was a case involving alleged members of the Irish Republican Army sending explosives to Northern Ireland, and uh, we had five defendants go to trial. Uh, in connection with that case, uh, and uh, they were attempting, uh, a couple of the defendants were convicted in Florida, co-defendants were convicted in Florida of buying a Stinger missile from an undercover agent uh, that they were going to use to shoot down uh, aircraft, and uh, that was a very memorable case. In fact, my lead defendant was the Grand Marshal of the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Phoenix. Uh, that year. I think that was about uh, 1994. Uh, in, uh, I also had a case involving a Border Patrol agent who stood trial for first degree murder. It was a case that was indicted in Santa Cruz County and it was transferred to federal court because he was on duty at the time and he requested that the matter be tried before a federal judge. So it was a state prosecution presided over by a federal judge in Tucson. And uh, that also uh, was uh, a memorable case. I had a Dalcon Shield uh, case that was an opt-out of the settlement action that was all about uh, uh, products liability from the use of the Dalcon Shield. And uh, of all things, a very interesting uh, case uh, involving ERISA and Circle K and all the Circle Ks uh, and their uh, retirement plan that was also a lengthy trial. Uh, and then there's any number of, of other uh, criminal cases. Going back to the IR8 case, uh, what was the outcome of that? The jury acquitted in the case. None of the defendants had actually stepped foot in Arizona. The co-defendants who had pled out in the Southern District of Florida were the ones who had been to Tucson to buy the uh, uh, the explosives, the detonators, and they were supposedly acting at the direction of the other four people, but the four, those individuals had never stepped foot into Arizona. It was all based on vicarious liability, including the jurisdictional uh, component of it, and uh, the, jury, uh, the jury ended up acquitting, hmm. acquitting them. A question about the Santa Cruz case. Was there a jurisdictional issue? How was that... Uh addressed. Could you tell us about that? Uh, there was there was no jurisdictional issue that either that either uh, uh, party raised and there wasn't anything that I mean it appeared that I, that the jurisdiction for it to be tried in federal court by virtue of a federal agent being charged for conduct in the performance of his official duties uh, that there was a removal right uh, absolute removal right by the uh, by the officer, and so the case was uh, came to federal court. Arizona is uh, one of the busiest districts in the country. Tell us, uh, if you would, a bit about your caseload and uh, how uh, you're able to manage that caseload uh, in today's world. Uh, Arizona presently, uh, as of this date, is first in the Ninth Circuit in criminal caseload, and we are fourth in the country of the 94 districts in criminal caseload. As far as sentencings, we are first in the Ninth Circuit and third in the country in the number of sentencings. Uh, and of course, uh, again, the caseload, I sit in Tucson where the criminal case load is largely located. In Tucson, we do about two-thirds of all the criminal cases in the district. Uh, 
that Phoenix does a third, plus they do 84% of all the civil cases. So Phoenix, the Phoenix district judges uh, have a criminal caseload, but they have a very heavy civil caseload. In Tucson, we don't have that civil component, but we have the criminal caseload. Uh, each of us sentenced between 500 and 600 defend defendants uh, per year, and uh, it's, uh, it is, it, a certain grind and there's a certain similarity. A lot of these cases are illegal reentry after deportation cases, uh, but a lot of them are alien smuggling cases as well. And of course, a lot of drug cases, a lot of port of entry cases. Some of the port of entry cases involve uh, corruption cases. Cindy Jorgensen, one of our judges, recently completed a very large case involving uh, a number of uh, different law enforcement officers who were arrested in a sting operation uh, in connection with the transportation of cocaine uh, and uh, their intent to distribute it. The alien smuggling cases uh, are becoming as complex as any of the drug cases. Right now I have a 55 defendant, 711 count alien smuggling case uh, with uh, so many ins and outs and overt acts uh, that uh, it is, of course, will end, end up breaking it down into different groups, smaller groups, uh, when, the, when those defendants who want to proceed to trial go to trial. But uh, they're, uh, they're certainly not like what we used to see, where you just have a couple people in the backseat of a car that happens to be stopped by Border Patrol. Those we see, uh, in fact, they have a cutoff. I don't think that they even charge people now unless they have at least 12 people in the vehicle that they're, that they're transporting. So we see any number of those. I see a lot of child smuggling cases. I've sentenced 45 child smugglers in the last four years, uh, and these are young children, uh, some of them 18 months, two years old, most of them almost all under eight years old, uh, so very young children and there are stranger cases where they do not know the parents. They don't have any uh, connection at all. They're doing it for money to bring the children across and, and a lot of them have records or drug addictions or whatever and someone offers them 50 or 100 or 200 dollars to smuggle a child and they take that uh, and bring them across the border. So uh, there's a little bit about the types of cases that we see. I, all of us meet with the probation officers every uh, after we've read all the reports for the each day, and we typically all in Tucson schedule four to six of these hearings every day, and we meet we read the reports the afternoon before when we're not in trial, and then we meet with the probation officers before the sentencings, and then we go into court and and impose the sentence. We also get a lot of revocation hearings with that many sentencings, and we are first in the country in revocation hearings. Uh, for revocation of supervised release or revocation of probation. So it, it's like a tread, treadmill and, and you cannot fall behind and you can't just take the luxury of deciding, I guess we won't do sentencing for a few days because you have, to, you have to keep them moving through and with the Speedy Trial Act, of course, these cases come up very quickly. Uh, the Speedy Trial Act doesn't apply after they've pled guilty, but until then, uh, you ha these cases are on a fast track. What are your chances of getting more judges? We hope that the chances uh, are, uh, are good. Right now, uh, there is not a, uh, a, a new judge bill that's in the hopper, but the Judicial Conference has recommended that Arizona get five new district judges. Four of them would be permanent and one temporary. So. Hopefully we will get those and hopefully at least a couple will end up in Tucson and, and I mean with Phoenix's caseload I know that they'll, they need them also but hopefully a couple, if we got our five that a couple could end up there. Uh, and it would make a difference because our caseload we received, uh, Arizona hasn't had a new judge since 2003 and that was in Phoenix. 2002 was the last time we had any judges added in Tucson. and. Cindy Jorgensen and David Burry were appointed at that time in 2002. Our caseloads are now back up practically to where they were when Cindy Jorgensen and David Burry were appointed and they were, the, uh, they were to help out and fill that. And 
And, the, you know, the cases we see just aren't likely to be the ones that are going to go away. I don't know that there is the immigration bill that's been drafted that would give amnesty to the people that I see. Everybody that I see has a, at least a, a felony conviction and sometimes multiple felony convictions or aggravated felonies with drug trafficking, child molestings, uh, burglaries, and so on. Uh, and uh, so I don't see a change in occurring there. And of course, our drug cases tend to be the larger cases. Sure. They don't prosecute under 500 pounds of marijuana now in Tucson in federal court. You are now the chief judge of the District of Arizona. Yes. How has your life changed with that uh, elevation? Well, it's another layer of responsibility. But, you know, my colleagues have been absolutely fantastic. They've been very supportive. The, I think the nicest thing about being chief judge is how it has brought me in such closer contact to the judges in the Phoenix Division because I think sometimes our caseloads are so heavy in Tucson and Phoenix, we don't even come up for air and get a chance to see the other judges. And as a, uh, uh, as a judge, uh, it's, uh, as chief judge, I, I regularly get a chance to visit and interact with our Phoenix Division colleagues as well, and of course with our magistrate judges in Yuma and in uh, Flagstaff. People have said that there are two cultures in Arizona, the Tucson culture and the Phoenix culture. And do you believe that's true? I, uh, I suspect that Phoenix is probably, uh, a, just by virtue of the different nature of the cases that we see predominantly, with Phoenix predominantly civil and Tucson predominantly criminal caseload, I suspect that has an impact and shows up in some respect. We're just about running out of time, John, but I'd like to ask you if there's some question that I have not asked you that you would like to tell me about. Uh, not particularly. I, I, you, you reminded me when you asked me about when I became a judge, I was thinking of my investiture and how at the end of that whole stressful process of all the interviews and the merit selection and the interview with the senator and so on, and uh, I always uh, joke that I that I hugged Judge Marcus and shook my wife's hand after I finally <laughs> had the oath administered to me. And I've gone to other investitures since then. And I heard Susan Bolton say when she had her investiture that she looked to her husband and said, honey, none of this would mean anything if you weren't here you know, with me. And uh, I, I thought I should have said that to Maureen, my wife, at the time, and then I remember Jim Tilborg's investiture when he talked about all the people that had helped mold him into the lawyer and the judge that he ultimately became. And he says, but I never forget who the master potter is. And I thought, why didn't I say that at my investiture? All the things, but it's like the trial, you know, you always think of the things you could have done differently. Yes, and I recall mine as more similar to yours than theirs, <laughs> and uh, it's kind of a blur, but somehow we made it through, didn't we? Yes. Well, thank you very much, John. Uh, it's been wonderful of you to give us of your time and participate in this video project. This is the first uh, uh, time that we've tried this, and uh, it looks like it's going to be very successful. So thank you very much for I'm coming. I'm very honored, and Paul, PJ, I'm glad that you were the one who did the interview. Thank you.